suggest, Patricia, maybe you can come a little bit closer to the microphone because we don't hear you very, very uh, close. Let me see if I can find headphones real quick. That might be better. Yeah, that might Okay. Okay, so we have law in France, Beverly in India, we have two in Pakistan, we have Olga in Uganda, we have Tanya in Spain, and I guess the rest of us are here. Let me just make sure. We have Laurent, Laurent in France. He's okay. In France. Yeah, do you hear me better now or no? Much better, excellent. Okay, great, great. Go now, ahead. if I'm too loud, you tell me. <laughs> no. okay. So, shall we officially begin? So, welcome then, everyone, to our Thursday uh, hangout. And uh, today, uh, we are visiting Kuala Lumpur with uh, Patricia, our champion, although uh, she's uh, fortunately or unfortunate, I guess it's both coming back to DC and uh, uh, leaving KL. A Khan was going to join her, another member of the chapter, but unfortunately she had a, has food poisoning, so she's unable uh, uh, to come. But for those of you, I think we have one or two people who ha may not have been here before. Our first day travels really provide you with the information with what we say that you can never get in a guidebook. Uh, it's practical information from families, WBG families, to uh, other WBG families. So before uh, I, I continue, let, can I ask uh, Patricia, could you just introduce yourself again, please? Sure, sure. So I'm Patricia Myers. Uh, not sure what information you want to know. So I am um, you. Some of you might have heard, I was born and raised in the Washington, D.C. area. I always had an, an itch to travel and see the world. Uh, always loved people of different con countries and cultures, probably inspired by my parents, who were very open that way. Um, so when I married my husband and we, um, we had babies, uh, life was a bit challenging in Washington when you have babies and a husband that travels a lot. So we decided we'd we'd move overseas. And so we lived in Romania initially, um, came home for a year. And then we've been in, we were in Jakarta for about three and a half years. And we moved from Jakarta to Kuala Lumpur. So another three and a half years in uh, Southeast Asia. So we've been in Southeast Asia almost eight years now. And we really love it. Um, yeah. Anything else? I have three kids. One's 25 and lives in Washington. And uh, two are with me here in Malaysia, and they're 14 and 13. Thank you. So let's start with what uh, lockdown. I know we've talked a little bit about that, or maybe uh, you're not uh, lock in lockdown in Kuala Lumpur, are you? Not anymore. And um, they went into lockdown pretty um, – as soon as we had a spike in cases, um, there had been sort of a big gathering. And from it, we had a lot of cases, like over 6,000, but they really were very firm about tracing those cases. And anyone who was detected with COVID was sent to a particular facility or two or three. And so they really kept it very under control and they locked down. We had a very strict lockdown. Um, they even had, you know, drones overhead and they were really quite serious. But it was very good because... Um, now, that was March 12th or 13th, I think we went into lockdown, uh, and then they've been progressively coming out, and so, like, this week, the pools even opened up, but they're doing it smartly. The pools open up, but maybe you have to sign up for an hour time slot, and there's only a certain number allowed in the pools at a time, so it's things like that, but they've slowly, the restaurants opened up initially with a very small amount of people, and now... It's almost normal in the restaurants. You still need to wear a mask and everyone takes your temperature. There's an, an app that is put out by the government that you need to have on your phone or should. They don't require you to. You can sign in if you prefer for privacy reasons not to have the app. But I find the app very easy. We just do the app and just so they have contact tracing. And really it's quite, feels very quite normal. Um, you have a very compliant uh, population here who really want to see it taken care of. So everybody wears masks 
for the most part, it's rare to see someone without one. It's just been really well um, well managed by the Malaysian government. That's good to know. Well, we won't talk about the contrast, but that 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 that, that, that uh, 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 is really really good to know. So, yeah. uh, if we just then go into life in Malaysia. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you think, uh, can you paint a realistic picture of what life is like for a WBG family if we were moving there? Sure. Might be ready to go already because it's right. Yeah, please table. come. I know. We really, really love Malaysia. We have enjoyed really every minute. And I'll tell you the background. I was in Jakarta and I loved Jakarta, but I also loved Romania. I think you decide before you move somewhere if you're going to like it or not. And so I just decide everywhere we move that I'm going to like it. Um, and then you find what's good and you make it your home. Um, but I kind of came to Malaysia kicking and screaming because I loved Jakarta and we really liked our life there. And we thought we were there one more year and I was sort of digging in. I really don't want to go. I really love Jakarta. And um, that wasn't a possibility. We moved to Malaysia and I just have loved every minute of it. Malaysia is, um, it really benefits from the fact that it's, It's very developed here, and it's actually quite Western. When we moved here, my daughter, for two weeks, said she really didn't like it, and she couldn't tell us why, and she was about 11 when we came, and I said, why don't you like it? And she said, it's very normal here. I guess she was saying in relation to Jakarta, which is a little bit more organic, and, you know, there's always something crazy or fun going on. So Malaysia's pretty tame. It's quiet. It's uh, clean. It's the city is nice. It's very well developed. You have great restaurants. You have um, great entertainment. You have a wonderful symphony, small symphony hall. Um, if you like shopping, there's lots of shopping here. It is hot. I mean, weather-wise, you'd have to be prepared for it being hot. It's just hot 99% of the time except for when it's raining. So maybe 90% of the time, because then it's raining about 10%. So it rains every day, pretty much during rainy season, and most of the year you get showers quite a few times a week, but it's not bad. I actually have learned to love the rain because it's sunny and then the sky opens up for two hours. Um, uh, It's pretty nice. It's a very mixed population. So you're not, um, I felt like sometimes in Jakarta I was, I stood out a lot. I don't at all in KL. Um, Those of you who know my family know we're a very mixed family. My husband's African-American, and the kids look very mixed. He's a fair skin, so looks like he could be Malaysian or Indonesian of sorts, and the kids look very mixed something. And um, we've we've blended nicely, um, but, but me looking very Western, I don't, I don't stand out or feel like I do. It's a very, it's a really welcoming country. The people are lovely. So yeah. And easy to get around. So. You live in KL, by the way, Patricia, or did you, I know you're in temporary accommodation now, but where were you living before? In Pataling Jaya? Mm. No, well, we were living in, um, we actually lived a different place than a lot of expats live, although we did it because of school and the neighborhood we lived in had quite a few families from our school. Um, we lived in an area called Sepute, which is in KL proper, but it's sort of the south of KL. So our address was actually uh, Kuala Lumpur, but it's sort of south of the city. If you're familiar, Yvonne, I don't know if you are, there's a huge mall by where we lived called Mid Valley Mall. And um, that's always the landmark I tell people. So we lived, but our area was more of a local area. Um, so a lot of uh, local uh, terraced houses, um, but just really fabulous neighbors. We walked around a lot in it. Um, it felt like suburbia, but it was actually in the city proper, uh, but a little different than where most expats lived. When we asked to live there, the realtor was like, why do you want to live there? No expats live there. But we really enjoyed it. And we had a lot of little local shops. The local noodle shop was my kid's favorite place to eat. So, so we were in Sapute. Um, now we're in an area called Mont Chiara, which I used to call the expat ghetto. But I really love it. It's really nice. It's very convenient. So, What made you decide to go to Sapute? Uh, um, so our kids went to a school called Alice Smith. 
And the primary school was really close, Alice Smith's uh, British International School. Um, it, along with the school called ISKL, are the oldest schools in Malaysia. And um, so our kids have been in British school since we lived in Romania, the younger two. We've just kind of kept them there all along. And um, Alice Smith was pretty close to the primary campus. And I, at least for the primary years, I wanted to drive them to school. So it was a quick drive. And there are quite a few families. There are kind of two compound neighborhoods tucked back in Sapute. There are quite a few families from Alice Smith in both those neighborhoods. So the, the princess, the Malaysian princesses don't wear the tiaras to school, do they? Because no, my they friend, don't. My friend's daughter went to Alice Smith, and she used to say the princesses wore their tiaras to the playground. No, yeah, I think they've really changed because I don't even know who the kids are. Actually, the queen for a season would come and drop her daughter off, and I had no idea who she was. She just looked like everybody else. It wasn't until somebody told me she was actually the the queen um, that that I learned that. But yet, yeah, no, I think the kids just kind of fade into the background like everybody else. I think they've sort of changed in that way. I think before that had been something people had said. But I think more of the kind of royal families in Malaysia go to the Garden International School now. I mean, Alice Smith has a few, but it's just not as, I mean, it's not noticeable necessarily. So, so that's a nice segue from the TRS to the schooling. So uh, what, what was the schooling situation like for, you know, if you were moving to Kuala Lumpur with, with, with families, what, mm. what's the scope of the schooling? Uh, schools are, there are a lot of choices and they're really quite good here. Um, we have stuck with British and um, so you have Alice Smith, which is the British school and it's lovely, really, really lovely. We have, I'm a, I'm a bit of a tiger mom, so I really ex have very high expectations academically. And um, Alice Smith has really met those expectations. We've been very happy with the performance, but they meet kids on all different levels. So um, they, they have accommodations for kids that need help, but then they'll also meet some of the kids that maybe need some additional pushing or additional uh, challenges. Um, we really, um, we really loved Alice Smith. So there's, there's about four or five really big ones, and two of them are American curriculum, and three are British curriculum. There's more British schools here, obviously, because the British, um, the connection with uh, Britain over the years here. Um, but there, you still have the IB schools. You have ISKL. So ISKL and Alice Smith are the two oldest schools and they're the only not-for-profit schools. So what you have is a bunch of uh, for-profit schools. You have a lot of them, but then maybe the big five schools, two are non-profit and three are for-profit. So, but even the for-profit ones, the academics are quite good. I mean, the, really, there's a really good, if you're looking for good academics, they're really there. We've, um, we've loved Alice Smith. Um, partly also because they have now a big co coaching culture and they work on coaching the kids and they want the kids to come up with their own solutions. And they even train parents in coaching. And we've really loved the environment there because of that. They've really, really created an environment where kids learn to self-advocate. And um, But I, most of the families at the World Bank group, their kids go to ISKL, which is the American Curriculum School. It has an IBN and American strain. And uh, we are the only family that's not there, I think. I think there might be one family at Mont Kiar International School, which is also an American curriculum. But, yeah. So schooling's great, really. You really have lots of choices. They're very good. So. Uh, is there anybody here, we have a lot of people online, uh, who might be moving to Kuala Lumpur or thinking about moving, who might want to ask Patricia any questions about schooling. If not, I will go on to the favorite topic, which is housing. Yes, Pamini, go ahead. I'm not moving, but I do have a question. And I also want to point out that we have a Malaysian native here who has grown up in Penang. Um, ah. She has joined us from Pretoria, and that's my friend Revati. 
Is she um, here online? She is here. Yeah, she is online. She's watching us and listening okay. to us. So if she has any um, additional insights, that would be great as someone who's a native. I mean, mine is definitely just a three-year posting person here, and it's my frame of reference. So I'd love to hear more from her. So, yeah. But I, also, I also do have a question. Yep. And uh, regarding children, I'm really curious because I moved a lot myself. Okay, different uh, places than you did, but um, how do your daughters handle this um, transition each time? Mm -hmm. And um, how do you prepare them? And uh, are they the classic third culture kids, as we call them? Mm. Um, let's see. So here with me, I have um, a daughter who's 14 and a son who's just about to turn 13 um, because they've done this since they were little I would say yeah they probably are the classic third culture kids um, adjusting I find in the international schools not so challenging because they work really hard to adjust the kids my daughter the older one she tends to go to school and comes home the first day and tells you she's made 20 new friends and she probably has and she's develops really close friendships and sticks with them. It's hard to leave usually because she's quite close. And there's lots and lots of um, tears from her friends. She actually stays quite strong. Um, this is a bit harder as a teenager. We're finding and moving back to the U.S. is harder for us than moving on to another international school because we're used to being expats. And it's a lot harder to go back to what's, quote, home but you don't really know anything about home. They haven't lived here since they were three and four years old. Um, but um, they've done really well. They both adjust pretty quickly and easily. My son takes a little longer to make friends, but is not unhappy necessarily, but just takes a bit more time to find his niche. Um, they seem to have both been able to adjust pretty quickly academically. Um, so, yeah, we do a lot of talking about um, the good and the bad. I used to. I didn't this time. But usually when we're moving, we put lists on the refrigerator. And one is what we'll miss and what we're looking forward to, just so that we can remind ourselves that there are positives and negatives and that there are things we really will miss. And we should really celebrate those things that we love about the place where we've been. But then also keep in mind to look forward to what we're going to. I think repatriation to your home country sometimes causes a little more trouble in that um, you're repatriating, but if you haven't lived there in a long time, you, you don't actually belong there and you feel like you're supposed to belong there. So we've told them to actually just treat it like it's a foreign country because to if them it is. Jump, if I can jump, I remember a family uh, – American and the kids barely lived in the U.S. They came back and uh, they had a very, very difficult time. Especially one reason is that the kids at school, mm -hmm. uh, they were invisible yeah. expats. The yeah. teachers and the colleagues, the, the, the classmates were not aware that the kids were not really American because no one yeah. they looked like, etc. So they didn't even had the 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 the, um, the barrier of the ESL special classes you know that us our kids have because they are second language mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they were yep. dropped into yeah. the jungle and yeah. nobody was uh, understanding they were not the regular kids so yeah it it is yeah. really a concern yeah yeah. yeah, I think that's yeah, very true, very true. I had a similar experience when we went back to India, and mm -hmm. uh, my daughter did not know how to speak Hindi. Yeah, so that's not my language. It's it's a different language, and the teacher would berate her in front of everybody. <laughs> oh my, yeah. So I guess we we hope for if what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Well, repatriation is the hardest bit. Uh, um, I, we found that when we went back to England for three years, I couldn't wait to get here. 
So <laughs> moving to Washington was the easiest thing. Was, I, I need to leave England. I really do. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still here, so uh, obviously not looking forward to going back. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so uh, Remedy, are you uh, able to, is your connection, would you like to say, yes, join in about Malaysia? <laughs> Hi, yes, I'm Remedy here. Um, you, you are right uh, about uh, Malaysia now, Malaysians being friendly and welcoming, that's so true. <laughs> and uh, how can I not agree with that? Uh, but I'm not very familiar with the expat scene in Malaysia. It's, it's, it's like that, right? When you go back to your country, you're no longer the expat. Uh, you, you, you're familiar with the expat situation in other places you've been to, but not in your own place. Uh, but I would say, um, you know, uh, for me, the, getting to know the locals, um, the people in the, um, the home country, it has always been a little bit challenging because, uh, mm. and I would like, I feel that um, to really get to know the country well, you'd like to get to know the people living there, right? But it's not always easy. But I think Malaysia could be one of those places where people are a little bit more open. Uh, yeah. If you live in Mount Kira, I think it's a mixture of uh, locals and expats or expats married to locals. So at least it's a kind of entry point to mm -hmm. get to see the um to get to know Malaysia. Yeah. We actually think, mm -hmm. Oh go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no. Yeah, and I think um because there are so many um you know different uh cultural interesting cultural um, aspects to it. It's so rich that you can your children have so much to learn and mm -hmm. for for you as well, you know, to, you know, you have Chinese temples and Indian food and yep. Malay, yeah. Pasar Malam. It's, mm -hmm. it's really um, a, a great place to be, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we absolutely agree. I feel like just such rich heritage and, and the people are really lovely. Um, we've sort of made it a point. We don't, we don't um, sequester off with all the expats. So Sapute was nice for us. Um, but I also joined a gym, and the gym I joined, since we lived in Sapute, I joined a gym, actually not close to Sapute, but one that a local friend from school, you know, the school is probably about 40% local now, Alice Smith is, so I've had quite a few friends that are locals or intermarried, and um, we joined a gym, believe it or not, that was, I think we're some of the only non-Malaysians at the gym, but it's been lovely. And we've really loved the experience. Both my husband and I go there and it's a kind of a close knit gym. It's not one of those big gyms that you're anonymous. It's only classes. And the reason why I joined it is they have a real focused program and there's a, you know, they sort of, but because of that, I've had a lot of relationships with those and then just some of my relationships through my kids. A lot of my kids tend to um, befriend more of the local kids, maybe because they've been overseas for a long time. And because they look different, they don't look, um, they're not blonde haired and blue eyed. Um, my daughter looks like she could be, yes, mixed African American or Hispanic or Indonesian mix. Um, they tend to... Or Chindian, right? They call it Chindian. Yeah, Chindian. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most of my son's friends are Indian or Bangladeshi or from Nepal. And uh, most of my daughter's friends are local Chinese. And we go to a church here that is a vast predominant uh, local Chinese church. And um, we've really... Um, we just, we really agree, can't agree with you more. I think the local people are very nice and they're very warm and they're very accepting. Um, so we've just really enjoyed our time here. We do feel like we kind of straddle the line between expat and local world where we have quite a few local friends. Um, and a lot of the folks at our church are locals who lived abroad and then came back because it's an English speaking church and just have really, yeah, just really enjoyed uh, getting to the local people, definitely benefiting from them showing you the really good local restaurants because the food here is amazing. So, <laughs> yeah, really, we've loved our time here. If anybody's thinking of moving to KL, don't <clears throat> even think twice. We really love it. Patricia, since you just mentioned the English speaking church, how is it with the English with language in the everyday life, shopping, etc.? Uh, yeah, so because um, 
So because Malaysia was under British rule or control for quite some time, English was widely spoken. Um, I'm not sure how many years ago, Revathin might be able to tell us, when it became, um, schooling became in Bahasa Malay. Uh, so more and more people do speak Bahasa Malay, but English is still widely spoken. It's always a second language at schools. I think it's promoted. People really um, know that it's important to learn it. It's, it's, at least in KL, very easy to get around because my whole world is in, in English pretty much. And, um, and I actually knew some Bahasa. I knew Bahasa Indonesian. They're similar, not exactly the same, maybe 70, 50 to 70 percent the same. Um, but it didn't translate. But also, um, I got very strange looks when I talked because most people just expect me to speak English here. Uh, where in Indonesia, they expected me to learn Bahasa. And that was, you know, Bahasa Indonesian. So you just had to learn at least some. But here, you know, it's very easy to get along in English. Is it nice to know some Bahasa Malay? Yeah, really nice. I think it's it's a good thing. But the, because it's multicultural here, you have um, you have the Malay people. You have a large Indian population um, that would speak English or a lot of Tamil. Um, and, of course, Bahasa. And then you have a large Chinese Malaysian population that speak um, Mandarin, some Cantonese, the older ones would have spoken Cantonese probably. Because um, uh, some of my friends who grew up here speak Cantonese. But um, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of English speaking, all the signs. You know, you have signs in both English and, and Bahasa Malay. So it's very easy to be English speaking. In some ways, that makes me sad because I, I like to learn parts of the local language. But it is still very kind and appreciated if you at least learn some. Uh, Malaysia actually is the best kept secret uh, in, the, in, in the expat world. It's <laughs> very easy. It's very cheap. Still very cheap. Very cheap. Uh, beautiful houses from new to colonial uh, uh, style mm -hmm. with beautiful gardens. Yes, I would go to Malaysia tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so, it, 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 so what about housing then? Housing. Okay, somehow how we ended up in Sapute was also I wanted a house because we'd been living in Jakarta in the city, but we were in a house in the city in Jakarta. But if you know anything of traffic in Jakarta, a house in Jakarta means you have a house with a yard and you don't go out much if you don't have to because the traffic's quite bad. And I really wanted our kids to have a neighborhood so they could, um, they could ride bikes, which neither of them knew how to ride a bike. So I wanted them to learn. And so we ended up in Sipute because it was quieter and it was a big compound neighborhood, tree-lined, probably 50% expat, 50% locals in our particular compound. And then the area around it was all locals. Um, so we loved our house. Everyone from the bank that came over would say, how did you get this house? But we were in an odd area. So for the same price that they were paying for condos in Mont Chiara or somewhere else, we were able to get a really beautiful house with a pool. And it was nice. The condos are also beautiful and large. And there's a lot of benefits to being in the condos. Um, so housing is really nice here. And it's affordable for what you get. Um, the, the condos tend to have lots of facilities, pools, tennis courts, squash courts, gyms, which is really nice. We didn't have the benefit of a lot of that stuff being in a standalone house, but we had the quiet and the peacefulness of the streets. But, yeah, housing, um, in terms of areas, uh, a lot of people, a lot of expats like to live in Mont Chiara, um, and it is quite convenient. And for schooling, it's convenient. All the buses go there. Um, we chose not to initially because I didn't want to be in a completely expat area and because we wanted a little more space in terms of ground. We want a little yard. Um, but the big ones are Mont Chiara, Bangsar, Damansara. Um, a lot of people choose to live in KLCC or some people choose to live in KLCC, which is the city center. I would think if you're a couple without kids, KLCC would be a great place to live. 
I don't find it as accessible for restaurants and things. If you like going out, if you like restaurants, Mount Kiara, Bangsar, those are great places to live. And now that we're in Mount Kiara, I think, wow, this is quite convenient. I know why people like to live here. I can just walk down to the shops. It takes me two minutes to walk to the grocery store. Uh, we have 30 restaurants within a 10-minute walking distance from us. And nice, all different from Western to <clears throat> Asian to anything you can think of. So, Patricia, um, did you do your yeah. own research or uh, was it all shown by the relocation agent? How, how did it work? Uh, okay, so I had a tenuous relationship with our relocation agent because I think they all want to point you at Mont Chiara. And... Um, How it works here is the agent that, so you work with, um, I'm not sure if it still works this way, but you work with a relocation company and they select the agent. But how agents work here is they show you the properties that they have. Because if they show you a property that's not one of their properties or that they have a relationship with the realtor, they have to work out a different commission structure. So they like to show you only the ones that they have. So I have a background in real estate from the U.S., number one, but also I've lived in Asia for a long time. And I had friends that had come from KL that lived in Jakarta. There's a lot of flex between Jakarta and KL in terms of the expat world. So I asked around a lot. I also had a few um, Malaysian friends in Jakarta who told me, you know, how to look, what to look for. Um, when we selected the school, our kids started school before we found the house. So we lived in temporary housing for about three months. And I just asked parents, I said, where would you live? This is what I'm looking for. And this is about our budget. And I would say um, you can always negotiate things look more expensive than actually you need to pay. So I would definitely negotiate and make sure your realtor knows you want to negotiate. So. Yeah, well, just, just a comment. I'm absolutely shocked uh, about what you are saying because those relocation agents, uh, the company is paid by the bank to support you. So it shouldn't be about commission. I, I think it's not... receive money from the bank... Yeah, no, no, it's not the your needs, right? Yeah, no, it's not the relocation agent that gets the commission. It's the realtor that they work with. So, but my understanding is the company that they used when I moved here has been let go, and they use a different company because I think I was not the only one that complained about that. Um, but I would still, even my friends who did not use that would say the realtors had asked to see houses in certain areas and the realtor would, would not take them necessarily. Or they'd say, but that house is available and, the, and they would have a reason why you couldn't see that house. But the reason why is because they don't, the realtor, not the relocation company, would not want to show you because they would not get the same commission. Um, So at the time, my relocation agent just only wanted to rely on the realtor. So I went out from under them. I got special permission, and I found the house I wanted, and I called the realtor who was representing the owner of that house and said, I want to see this house, and I want to move in. <laughs> Does that make sense? But I was kind of I, – I did it. I, I kind of went out on my own, and not everybody has the confidence to do that, but we've lived in Asia for a while, and I had friends that were Malaysian who – told me how to kind of navigate the system. And, um, and because I have a background in real estate also, so maybe I felt a little more comfortable um, negotiating on my own. Um, but then I found the house, I negotiated the deal, and then I brought the relocation agent back in. So I, I, wouldn't, re I wouldn't suggest doing that, but I wasn't finding what I wanted under the relocation agent, so I just went out on my own. Sorry, <laughs> I'm a little bit of a rebel sometimes. <laughs> Good. Maybe when you come back, we all need to get together and think of uh, doing a webinar on how to manage the relocation agent that sure. the bank provides can you. I, can yes, I try okay. again, Yvonne? Yeah, because what she's saying, I'm sitting here nodding my head, because we had exactly the same experience in Sierra Leone and in Nigeria and Abuja. So and let's put our heads together and uh, uh, think about that. This uh, If this has emerged, Beverly, so maybe if we pool and, and have a global picture, this is something mm -hmm. we can do in the fall uh, because it helps, it, it, it helps our people since 
the, the service is being provided for. They, it shouldn't be there to agitate you. It should be there to, 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 to help you, you know. But uh, people let's know that they don't have to stick with it. The people need to know that they don't have to be locked in by that. Like Patricia saying, and we also, in, our, in both places, found our own accommodation, aside from what the relocation agent was showing us. So mm -hmm. people need to know that have the courage to do that. Yeah, so I would just, uh, just like to quickly add that it's quite the same in Washington, D.C. Yes, so I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is a technique of real estate agents, you know, because uh, uh, mm -hmm. I guess I guess that's how, how that's how that profession can work. And yes, with Patricia's help, we can do a seminar, a webinar on this very topic. Yeah, and hopefully when I go back, I'll re-up my real estate license and go back into real estate. I'll try and be a good one that shows you lots of everything. No, I'm kidding. So. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you'll be good and fair. But uh, anyway, let's talk. It's a nice lead in into employment opportunities uh, because a lot of our spouses uh, like to, 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 to work or want to work. Uh, mm -hmm. What is it like in Malaysia in terms of work permits? Mm. Um, so under our spouse permit, we are not permitted to work. Um, if you have a real skill and talent, I would assume it's fairly easy to get an employer. If you can find a job, get an employer to hire you and uh, convert your permit over. A lot of people I know, um, you know, people come to KL and they just stay. So I have a lot of friends who've been here 15, 20 years, 9 years, 10 years. And what they do is their spouse converts to a, um, a talent visa, which is a 10-year visa, and then they are on the 10-year visa with their spouse. So a lot of companies allow you to do that. Now, with the bank, that's not possible because we have sort of a quasi-diplomatic visa here. It's, a, it's not exactly straight diplomatic, but it's a little bit of a quasi. Um, so you would have to find your own employer who would provide you with um, a work permit. But I think KL is expat friendly in terms of working um, in that um, if you have a real skill and talent that a company needs, they should be able to get you a visa. It take, you know, to get a work permit, say if I'm terribly gung-ho to work and I arrive, how how long would it take me to like if I okay yeah you couldn't get one without a job you'd have to have your uh, be hired and get an employer so when um when I've been here um so the um the former uh, country manager his wife worked but she worked for an outside company and she did not collect her salary in Malaysia she did consulting work um. You know, she she had relationships from from previous, so she did uh, consulting work, uh, but just happened to be based in KL, and she was paid in U.S. dollars. Um, there was another spouse that lived here who also worked uh, when she came, and she retained that job and actually moved to another one. But the same deal, she was a consultant, and she when she got hired as a staff for that other organization. There were some visa back and forth about how much work she could do in Malaysia, how much, and she ended up spending maybe 50% of her time in the U.S. So I think if you really want to work in Malaysia and stay in Malaysia, you'll need to find a Malaysian employer to hire you. And um, yeah. sorry, in terms of the talent visa, let me just say, they, you can get a talent visa, but you have to have lived here three years to apply for it. So it doesn't work. And as far as job searches are concerned, uh, is how easy is it to find something, or mm -hmm. are they, or do you have to do the search on your own, or are they agencies, or you, do you need contacts? You know, I did not look, so I can't really speak to that well. You know, it's um, it's like any modern city. I know there are places that you can, there are websites that you can look for doing recruiting, but I can't speak to it that well because I just decided it wasn't worth it really. So I didn't, I didn't work. So I don't, and the two people I knew from the bank that worked here worked for outside organizations that worked in for companies outside of Malaysia. Um, I have friends that have gotten jobs here and usually they've done it through contacts. 
friends that are not World Bank but or, or have been here a long time will get it through their contacts. So it looks like networking, and I guess for those who are online who want to work, I think the best thing before you move is if you really want to work is to find out the immigration situation so that you're not caught on the on on, on the wrong foot uh, yeah. going in, uh, in or out. Uh, I mean, I used to visit Malaysia a lot as a kid because our family was from Penang and we used to stop uh, in KL. So I had cousins living there and things. Uh, it's English speaking, so if you're English speaking, uh, uh, find a job would not be difficult. Right, but absolutely. Change and Bahasa uh, uh, is very important as well. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think uh, if you really want to work, I guess the best thing is to find out uh, the most current information. Uh, we yeah. have uh, questions here in the chat, and one of it is Patricia, how do you spend your free time? Oh, if I had free time, <laughs> if I had free time, um, I actually got really involved at school. It wasn't deliberate. I just I wanted to know more about their school. Um, when we first moved, there were some adjustment issues in terms of what the kids knew or didn't know. And, um, you know, every school has their particular way. So I got involved with the PTA because that's how you find out about school, because the PTA ladies know everything. So if you have kids and you need to find out about the school your kids are in, just join the PTA. You'll hear everything in the first week. That's what I found everywhere I've lived. Um, So even if you're not a PTA person, that's where you get all the good info. In the end, they actually, after just three months, asked me to the next year take the presidency of the PTA. So it was kind of almost a full-time job. And so it's a big school. So I did that. And then um, now I've moved over and I'm on the board at school. So I sit on the, the board for school. So I do that. I, um, I, we are pretty involved in the church we're in. So I also lead the youth group there with my husband's help. We lead the youth. Um, uh, I do some Bible studies. I have also spent time teaching at refugee schools. There are plenty of refugee schools, need lots of teachers. Um, I volunteered also for an organization called the Lost Food Project, um, which works on um, basically recovering lost food. By that, they mean food that would be generally thrown away by supermarkets or restaurants or things like that. They collect it and sort it. And if it's what's edible, even manufacturers, if like Campbell's or someone has dented cans, they have to get rid of the whole pallet. So they take the pallet and they provide it with a lower income people and refugees here. And so I did um, some work for them in terms of marketing and things like that. So I've spent, I I tend to not be the lady who lunches. I do some, but I like to find uh, purposeful and meaningful things to do where I live. Um, So as part of the PTA, one of the things I did is help um, disperse the monies that we would get. So we give money every year to different local organizations. And so I worked to help one year. I had I contacted a thing called my, uh, an organization called my readers and I helped um, them give money to my readers for books. My readers um, helped with literacy and um, teaching reading in English to students. And surprisingly, it really helped with, the reading and Bahasa skills because the skills translate the same, but theirs was generally a, a, um, a reading in English. Um, I play tennis. I like to play tennis. I joined a gym and my gym is a pretty intense. So I went about five times a week to the gym in the morning. Um, and then I spent my time other than that either just going grocery shopping or I did not, I had a live-in helper when we moved here that we brought from Indonesia. We had a fairly sizable house here. Um, When she chose to go back to Indonesia after a year because she missed it, um, we then just had very part-time. And so I also did a lot of work in the house. So driving my kids, driving my kids around to activities. My daughter dances a lot, maybe eight to 12 hours a week. So after school, I drove her and my son does rock climbing about six to seven hours a week. So I spend a lot of time at both those places in the afternoons. Yeah. I mean, people ask what I do. I said just what I would do in the U.S., drive my kids around. 
response. You 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 are busy. We have another question in the chat and said, Patricia, please tell us a little bit about local culture and craft and how to mm-hmm. access them. Oh yeah. So the crafts here are beautiful. Um anything from uh the art. If you really want local arts, the batik, and there are lots of places. If you're here, you just Google batik, and you can find lots of places to even go and get batik done. Um, There are women's organizations that will help you find a lot of these. So there's the British Women's Association, which I joined, even though I'm American. Anyone can join the the British women's here. I think there's an American group that's sad to say as an American, but because my kids were in a British school, I tend to just do the British groups. Um, the British Women's Association here is quite large because they were um, connected with the British for so many years. And the British Women's Association is Malaysians, it's British, it's Americans, it's Australians. Um, and a lot of those put out, they put out information on how to find and access the local craft culture. There's a place in the city where you can go and buy local crafts. It's very touristy. Um, In order to find the real local crafts, I would suggest going to some of the local craft fairs, but also asking around because um, it took me a while to find the real local crafts and not just like the tourist representations of the local crafts. I'm not saying they weren't local crafts, but it was easier to find once you asked local people. So if I asked a local person, I'm interested in finding out about batiking, where could I go? So, but I think also culturally, because I'd lived in Southeast Asia and the Malaysians and the Indonesians have some connection in terms of culture and crafts and things like that, that I knew what I was looking for and what to ask for. So some of it might be, if you don't, is um, getting involved with a local organization, even at school the different moms at school. For me, it was the local moms at school. I just would, I just made friends and approached them and asked them if I, you know, what they could tell me. And so, yeah, that's, I would say the best way is to ask local people. And they're very willing and very open. Really, I honestly find the Malaysians very open, very easy to talk to and very willing to, to help you find what you want. And they love it when you're interested in their culture. So... Another question, Patricia. What's mm-hmm. the WBFN community like? Mm, it's been in and out. One of my um, – so right now, I think the two main people would be Han and myself. It's a smaller office here. Um, a lot of the – several. so Monica was here. Monica, uh, who her husband had been the country manager. They've moved on to Nepal. But um, – we spent time with Monica. Two of the other spouses have worked. Some of the World Bank Family Network spouses are, um, there used to be some younger couples and they were quite fun to hang out with, um, but they've relocated back to Washington. One of my hearts to see, I know the World Bank Family Network says family, but I think Yvonne and I have talked about that is what's the connotation of family? Is it we're the World Bank family or is it the World Bank and your family? because we have a lot of single people on assignment here because of how the office is set up here with a lot of singles. And we made friends with quite a few of the singles. And so when we did things as even the, the expats, we would invite the single guys, mostly guys, there's a few females also, but right now it's mostly guys. So we would include them and they weren't technically part of the world bank family network, but to me, they were all part of the world bank family. If you emphasize it differently. So I liked to, um, so we like to have the single folks around. There's a, a lot of young people in the office here, a lot of young single people. And the office are young, newly married in the office, locals. And, and then uh, the expats are quite a few single expats as well that aren't part of the World Bank Family Network. Sometimes I found that um, those involved in the World Bank Family Network were harder to reach out to. Um, there were only a few of us. And right now it's basically Han and I and um, one one lady who is the one who works and her husband is the spouse, but he also works and spends a lot of time not in KL for his job. So, so it is a smaller office here. So 
not so when we were in Jakarta it was a huge office and we had a very active group of World Bank Family Network folks and things that we did together but here it's a much smaller office so thank you Sarah do, do are there any more questions uh, for Patricia we have about um, five minutes uh, 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 five uh, minutes more yeah, you all have a question. I uh, just wanted to ask. Patricia was saying that she drives her children around, as as I guess we do in DC area as well. Um, in terms of the public transportation, um, how good is that? You probably, I'm not sure whether you are in the suburbs. That's why you have to drive them. And if, uh, uh, is it safe for children to use a bus or something? Uh, okay, so public transport, you know, um, mine were young enough that I wouldn't have put them on the public transport. Um, perhaps uh, some people would, but I didn't. We do, they do have several metro lines. There's um, light rail lines and KTM. They are pretty easy to use. Um, in terms of public buses, they all have quite a few of them. Um, I do not use those as often. I use the subway fairly often if I didn't want to have to park. Um, I never sent my kids alone on them. And a lot, most of the places they went weren't accessible necessarily. Where her dance was, where his um, climbing was, no, not accessible. So I drove. They do have something uh, akin to Uber here called Grab. And uh, Grab's really easy. And by this age, my older daughter at 14, if she was with friends, can take a Grab. And Grab's pretty easy. It's just an app. And it's just like Uber. It's just the local version of Uber and works really, really well. So we have a uh, last uh, uh, question about uh, weekend, weekend trips away. What do you, how easy is that? Uh, do people do that a lot? Yeah, I'm I'm going to move because I think my network connection is getting a little bad. I might actually, you can see a little bit of the skyline if I take you outside, and my connection is really good outside on our porch. Um, tell me your question again. I was distracted by we, doing, we can oh, weekend away. trips away. Oh, my goodness. So much to do right here in Malaysia. Um, here, I'll show you. This is Mont Chiara. This is the skyline. So you can see it's not... I mean, it's very developed. There's high rises all around behind me, brand new ones. Um, let's see, weekend trips away, lots of places in the country and very accessible for driving. So you can drive just about anywhere in Malaysia very easily. But you also have Air Asia. Um, it's inexpensive and really safe airline, great. No frills, not fancy, but you don't need frills. And you can get anywhere in Asia pretty quick. Um, so not just weekend trips away, but our trips, we've done a lot of different trips throughout Asia, from Cambodia to Vietnam to, oh gosh, I, I can, I'd have to go through my list, but we went to Laos uh, just before the lockdown. We went for in December. We were supposed to go to China in April, but that didn't happen, obviously. But it's just very accessible here. And because you have Air Asia, which is inexpensive and really a very decent airline, it's based in Malaysia, um, uh, just reliable and safe and, we, and inexpensive. So we've really gotten to travel a lot of Asia very easily. But if you want to take quick trips in Malaysia, there are the mountains not far. Cameron Highlands is beautiful. The tea plantations are absolutely gorgeous. Stunning. If you don't want to go that far, there's Fraser's Hill, which is really close. Um, there's a lot of glamping places around, which aren't even like fancy from anywhere from fancy glamping to, uh, to camping, not far within an hour of the city. I hike a lot, even in the city. There's quite a few places to hike within the city. And we as a family would drop my daughter off at ballet and there was a place to hike right by. She had two or, two or three hours there and we would go hiking the rest of us. So even staying in the city, quite a lot of places to hike here. Um, and just quick, even in Malaysia, if you want to go to Malaysian Borneo, if you want to go to Sarawak, Sabah, at least the areas where you're, where it's suggested you can go. There are some areas where they suggest you don't go. But, um, but beautiful, too. Beautiful beaches, 
beautiful mountains in Mulu on Borneo. There, we went to the caves there, and just stunning caves and mountain hiking. So very easy to, I mean, I think when we lived in Indonesia and we traveled throughout Asia, we always had to go through KL. So KL is really a hub for Asia and very, very easy to get to Bangkok. You're there in just a couple of hours. Really very easy. Yeah, Cambodia, Thailand, the Thai islands, very easy. Uh, Langkawi is a Malaysian island, beautiful. There's some Malaysian islands you can drive to. We'll go to the Perhentians next week. And then we'll go to another small island called Pangkor Laut. And, uh, yeah, there's lots of Malaysian islands that you can drive to, beautiful. So islands, mountains, tea plantations. You can go to Malacca, which is history and really interesting. You can drive north to Penang. And the food and the beaches, Penang is amazing. We love it. We love to uh, tool around the spice garden there. Um, yeah, Ipo, if you really like Malaysian food, you go to Ipo and you just eat your heart out for a weekend. Um, yeah, lots of very fun, easy. And it's very, very easy, accessible to drive, no problem. Drive to Singapore easily. I think it's easier to drive. Actually, four hours, and you're in Singapore. The longest thing about getting into Singapore is immigration. <laughs> you got to go at the right time. The so, Causeway, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, then Ipo, the Chakwai Tiao, Reverend Jay? I'm sorry? The Chakwai Tiao in uh, yeah. Ipo, Ipo Kwai Tiao. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's all the food we, we know. One. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, just make sure you like spicy if you move here, because you gotta eat spicy food. You can get non-spicy, but the spicy is the best. Correct, correct. So, uh, one uh, uh, question we have one last question remaining, although we're bang on time, and then mm-hmm. I will ask Reverty if she wants to say anything as the Malaysian on call, and then Padmini uh, uh, to say thank you. But we have one last question which is what about the health care system? Ah, ah, that's a great question because I always tell people we loved Jakarta except for the traffic pollution and lack of health care. So in Malaysia, when we did, we loved Indonesia. So not knocking it, we absolutely loved it, found it fabulous. But Malaysia, the health care system is very, very, very good. Really good, very easy. Um, everything from you can go to the fancy... Uh, international hospitals, but even, you know, sometimes I'll ask a friend and she'll say, you know what, go to the local hospital for that particular thing and use this doctor. Um, Really very good, very accessible, inexpensive medical care. I go once a year to Prince Court, which is an international hospital, and I do a full physical, and I'm talking full physical there. I am there from 8 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They do everything you can think of, and the cost is about $500. And then I apply it to my, I mean, that's from your mammogram to your eye exam to a personal meeting with a dietitian. I mean, I can't even tell you. To, uh, it, it's fabulous. The health care is very, very good here. Dental care is fantastic and inexpensive as well. Very well-trained doctors. Um, in that a lot of the doctors are trained here. You have great medical schools here, but you also have people who train in Singapore, who train in Australia, who train in the UK and even the US. And they return, they come home. And um, and they're fabulous. Really, the doctors here are fabulous. So. I think, uh, Remedy, the last word before per minute. (laughs) Uh, I'm convinced. Yeah, I'm actually, my husband and I tell our kids we're going to do Malaysia, my second home, and we're going to just retire here because we love it so much. Try Penang. Yeah, and cheaper, actually. <laughs> Penang's cheaper, and you have more access to the water, yeah. Yeah. No, I, all I want to say is if anyone has an opportunity to relocate there, really, I think it's one of those uh, popular places high on the list to move yeah. to because of the language, because of the healthcare. Schools, the main things, right? The three main things and yep. activities, everything else. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. except it's hot, but we get used to that. Yes, it's fine. I like hot. But you can okay. always go to Cameron Highlands or Fraser's Hill, if you know, or even Genting, if yeah. if, if you if if you uh, got too too hot. 
Yes, and by the way, for a Singaporean, and don't tell my government because I'll go to prison, I actually think that Malaysia is uh, uh, better than Singapore for expats because it's a whole lot cheaper with yes. all the benefits of Singapore without the cost. But don't say I Absolutely. said it. So, but Mini. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can chew gum. <laughs> So uh, what can I say? What an what an amazing amazing uh, session this was. Uh, I learned a lot about Malaysia and Patricia, you made it sound so attractive that yeah. uh, honestly, I feel like it's going to be the number one destination for our World Bank families. Yeah. And uh, I already knew uh, a lot about the food there because my friend Revati uh, is a great cook. And we've benefited from her cooking many times. Uh, but um, so many good things. Very highly recommend a place to move to. And so I would like to thank you, Patricia, for joining us today and answering our questions so well. Uh, clearly, I can see that you are a seasoned expat. And most importantly, I think you have done some research about how to prepare the children and yourself for the moves, and therefore I think you've really enjoyed them a, a lot as well. Yeah, so I think that's you. an important tip for all the families here as well. Mm. And having said that, I would also like to thank all the people who have joined us today. Uh, I know that you've enjoyed it a lot. So um, until next time, when we visit another wonderful destination, uh, which is, I think, uh, Ethiopia, if I'm not wrong. Is it? No, yeah. Bangkok first. Bangkok next week. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so it's Thailand first and then. So thank you once again. And, you know, over here in America, we have the 4th of July weekend starting. Uh, yeah. uh, pretty much uh, starts pretty much from the afternoon today. So for all the ones who are going to celebrate that, happy 4th of July. And see you next time. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, much, Patricia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Patricia. Very welcome. Bye bye. And I'll see all of you in Washington in a few weeks. Yes, looking forward to it. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. We will we will not let you escape. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Thank you. Thank, all. You. Thank you everyone. Bye. And have a great day. Bye, Karen.